The backbone of the Indian economy has always been the Indian soil and its response to the Indian farmer. But when the British came, they completely destroyed our economy through a systematic exploitation of the people and the resources. 20% of the revenue of British India was collected from the land. Even the most common of every common man's need, salt, was taxed. British ships used salt for ballast and dumped it on India's shores. This too was taxed. Cotton grown in India was sent to England to be manufactured into cloth and imported back into India and sold at enormous profit. British trade and industry prospered and in turn Indian industry was destroyed. The people of India were engaged in a relentless battle to put an end to this exploitation and assert their right to freedom. The 1929 Congress at Lahore, under the presidentship of Jawaharlal Nehru, passed the memorable resolution of Purna Swaraj, complete independence. January the 26th, 1930, was celebrated as Independence Day all over the country. The national flag was hoisted and the people took a pledge to fight for complete independence. On February 14th and 15th, 1930, the Congress Working Committee met at Sabarmati Ashram to prepare plans for the follow-up action. Gandhiji was requested to lead the country. Mahatma Gandhi published his manifesto, the 11-point program for Swaraj, total prohibition, reduction in land revenue, the abolition of salt tax, reduction in military expenditure, reduction in salaries of senior officials, and other economic measures which would help the masses. In his editorial entitled, When I Am Arrested, Gandhiji criticized the government monopoly in the manufacture of salt and the exorbitant tax on salt. On March the 2nd, 1930, he gave an ultimatum to the Viceroy. Dear friend, before embarking on civil disobedience, I would fain to approach you and find a way out. The British rule has impoverished the dumb millions by a system of progressive exploitation and ruinous, expensive civil and military administration, which the country can never afford. I respectfully invite you to pave the way for the immediate removal of those evils and thus open a way for the real conference between equals. If my letter makes no appeal to your heart, on the eleventh day of this month, I shall proceed with my workers of the ashram to disregard the provisions of the SALT law. Viceroy Irvin merely sent a message regretting the course of action contemplated by Gandhiji. The Mahatma was visibly upset and said, On bended knees I asked for bread and I received stone instead. The die was cast. Gandhiji decided to launch the civil disobedience movement. It was to be a march from Ahmedabad to the seaside village of Dandi. And at the end of the 380 kilometer journey to manufacture salt and thereby break the entirely mercenary law. On the 9th of March, 1930, more than a hundred thousand people assembled on the banks of the Sabarmati River to pledge support to Gandhiji. 
the Mahatma selected 78 Satyagrahis from the different parts of India and also from Nepal and Fiji. On the 12th of March, Mahatma Gandhi embarked on his historic march, which was to shake an empire and eventually change the course of the destiny of India. The marchers ranged in age from 16 to 60 years. Gandhiji was the eldest, and yet he walked so fast that others had difficulty in keeping up with him. News of this great march reverberated in many parts of the world. In a church in New York, the young reverend John Holmes asked his congregation to pray with him for the success of the march. He was reminded of Christ's march from Galilee to Jerusalem to face death and glory. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. On the fourth day, the marchers reached Nadiad. They were greeted by over 20,000 people. Many government officials in different parts of Gujarat had already resigned their jobs. Gandhiji asked others to follow suit and said, I do not see anything in the service of the Raj, except that you get the power to commit zulum, that is tyranny. In Anand, Gandhiji stayed at a school. He asked the students who were above the age of 16 to leave school and join the freedom movement. Throughout the long march, Gandhiji maintained his vigorous self-discipline. Every night he sat up late to reply to the hundreds of letters that poured in daily and to writing for the papers he edited. He also found time for his daily spinning. Jawaharlal Nehru said, Today, the pilgrim marches on his long trek. Staff in hand, he goes along the dusty roads of Gujarat, clear-eyed and firm of step, with his faithful band trudging along behind him. The field of battle lies before you. The flag of India beckons you. And freedom herself awaits your coming. Along the route, Gandhiji was received with love and affection. He told the people, the government's policy is satanic. It is a sin to be loyal to this government. I have therefore made sedition my religion. According to a secret British dossier, 60 officials of Borsad district resigned their jobs in response to Gandhiji's call. Village of Ras, 
He asked the people to go and manufacture salt, which was a necessity of life, and which should be had at a very small cost of money and labor. Dandiji stayed at the Dharamshala and received gifts from a large number of government officials. The gifts were in the form of their resignations. The great march had started with 78 followers. Every hour, every day, the number increased and became a mass movement, a human flood of determination. Gandhiji said, we are marching in the name of God. We profess to act on behalf of the hungry, the naked and the unemployed. At Navsari, the Mahatma said, history records no other instance of a community having practiced such dispassionate generosity. Whenever I have stretched out my hand before the Parsis, it has never returned empty. Approaching his destination, Gandhiji said, Either I should return with what I want, or my dead body will float in the ocean. It was at this glorious moment of defiance that the women of India joined the mainstream of the movement through their leader, Sarojini Knight. On the 5th of April, Gandhiji and his band of Satyagrahis reached Dandi. At the evening prayer, he asked the people throughout the country to support the movement and said, I want world sympathy in this battle of right against might. On the 6th of April, 1930, Gandhiji went to the seashore. At 8.30 in the morning, he picked up a handful of salt in a symbolic act of defiance. It was a signal for the people of India to launch the civil disobedience movement, to break the salt law and defy the British rulers. In the words of Nehru, salt suddenly became a mysterious word. A word of power. All over India, UP, Bihar, Orissa, Bengal, Maharashtra, women came out from the seclusion of their homes and joined the Salt Satyagraha. Peasants refused to pay land revenue. From Trichinopoly, Chakravarti Rajagopalachari led a salt march to the beaches of Vedaranyam. The district magistrate had issued an ordinance that the villages along the route should not supply food to the volunteers. People defied the authorities by preparing food at night and hiding it on trees and in the bushes. After covering a distance of 240 kilometers, the Satyagrahis reached Vedaranya on the 30th of April. When they picked up the symbolic handful of salt, they were all arrested. In the northwest frontier province of India, Kudai Khidmatkars, led by Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, staged a peaceful demonstration. At Peshawar, armored cars and machine guns killed many demonstrators, but the people remained defiant. 
A platoon of Gadwal rifles was ordered to open fire on the peaceful Pathans. The Gadwalis refused. They were court martialed The government repression increased. Gandhiji called it a Gunda Raj and asked the people to answer this organized hooliganism with greater suffering. He sent a letter to the Viceroy which said, God willing, I would raid Dharasana salt works. Gandhiji was arrested on the 4th of May. After the Mahatma's arrest, Abbas Payabji took over the leadership. When Payabji too was arrested, Sarojini Naidu led 2,500 volunteers to raid the salt depot. She told the volunteers, you must not resist, you must not even raise a hand to ward off a blow. As the Satyagrahis advanced to the salt pans, 400 policemen greeted them with steel-tipped lathis and rifles, beating them mercilessly on their heads and shoulders. But not one resisted. Describing the scene, American journalist Webb Miller reported, In 18 years of reporting in 20 countries, I have never witnessed scenes as harrowing as those at Dharasana. Those struck down fell sprawling, unconscious. The survivors, without breaking ranks, silently and doggedly marched on until struck down. More than 40,000 volunteers raided the Vadala Salt Works in Bombay. In spite of this mindless violence, in spite of all the armed might behind it, the Raj was losing its grip on India. Louis Fisher, in his assessment of the impact of the Salt March on the Indian political scene, has said, the British beat the Indians with batons and rifle butts. The Indians neither cringed nor complained nor retreated. That made England powerless and India invincible.